This is the kids hour on the highlight. The Adventures of Sailor Sam. the creak of the rigging? Listen to the wind whip the sails. Yes, boys and girls, Sailor Sam's big schooner, the porpoise, plunges swiftly through the waves, eager to serve her master. Where's she going? Wish I could tell you, but we'll have to find out from Sailor Sam, an adventurous young man whose hunt for scientific truth takes him anywhere. Yes, anywhere. And with him go his two young cousins, Buddy and Nancy. My eye, mate, it's full speed ahead now for seafaring thrills with Hello, Sam! Hello, boys and girls. This is Ollie Olson. Say, Sam and his gang are headed toward new adventure. What kind? Well, I don't really know. When is it going to happen? Sorry, but I can't answer that either. What do you say you join us, though? That is Sam, Hazel, Buddy, Nancy, and myself as we speed toward Chicago aboard a fast train. Now, generally speaking, riding aboard a train is pretty quiet. Oh, you can look at the scenery, uh, or you can snooze. Uh, of course, whether or not it's possible to do this with Sam and the gang around is another question. Get ready to jump aboard in a hurry, because here comes the train right now. <laughs> the life all right no decks to swab no salesmen no lines to run when we get to chicago let's make another round trip just for the ride <laughs> Honestly, buddy, i think the older you get the lazier you get yep that's me buddy the lazy man i live longer that way <laughs> sometimes i think that's more truth than fiction yes but i guess we get so used to a fast pace that we can't slow down we won't be able to sit around and loaf when we get to chicago paper says it's still cold there. Uh, we'll find out when we get there in the morning. Well, I see there's some patches of snow on the ground, though, even this far south. Yeah, I think I'll get out my long-handled red flannels, <laughs> the electric ones. Who oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, ever heard of electric red flannels, Ollie? Well, I don't know, but they've got electric blankets. Oh, uh, where would you get power? Oh, carry a battery with you. Oh, oh <laughs> boy, and if you get a short circuit where you sit down, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys, I'll say one thing. You sure keep life dazzling with exuberance or something. Dinner served in the dining car. First called dinner. Dinner served. Hey, First that's what's dinner. wrong with me. I'm hungry. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Now hear this. All hands move forward to the galley. All right, All right sir. sir. I got it. Phew, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown watching the dishes almost slide on the floor. Yeah, they should have some kind of gadget, you know, to, so you could tell when the curve is coming, and then you could hold on to your pork chops. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, Ollie. You know, I'm simply amazed at the waiters, how they can get around like they do and not have an accident, the way the train lurches. Well, they've got train legs, just like we got sea legs to walk around the porpoise and stay right side up. Well, that sounds logical. You? Now, what's the matter, Nancy? One of the waiters almost lost his train leg. I thought he was going overboard. <laughs> Say, we'd better tend to our eating our meal. We don't want to tie up this table all day. No, oh, that's a good okay. idea. <laughs> I sure hope we can find Sam Stone when we get to Chicago, Mary. Hey! It'll be a shame to come all this way for nothing. I might be doing just that. They say he never stays in one place very long. I wonder if he is returning to Chicago. I hope we can find him. I think he's the only man in the whole wide world who can find the river shark. That is, if he can be found. Thank you, William. We'd better go back to the observation car so someone else can have our table here. Yes, let's do that. Sam, did you hear that? I sure did. What's a river shark? I don't have the slightest idea. My curiosity's straining at the leash, though. Yeah, and 
heaven's sake, Sam, it sounds awful mysterious. I say it does. I've heard of sea sharks, sand sharks, and lots of other sharks, but never a river shark. That goes for me, too. They look like awfully nice people. What are you going to do? I'm going back to the observation car and identify myself. Maybe we can find out what a river shark is. <laughs> Excuse me. May I speak with you? Why, of course, sir. My name is David Lindstrom. And this is my wife, Mary. How, How do you do? do? Uh, this is my first mate, Ole Olson. And my name Ole is... Ole Olson? Then you can be only one person if Ole's your first mate. That's right. I'm Sam Stone. <laughs> Mary, how about this? We're traveling to Chicago to see you, Mr. Stone. And here we find you on board the same train. <laughs> how did you know we were looking for you? Well, we uh, overheard some of your conversation in the dining car. Dave, this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to us. Little did we realize we were seated next to you. Oh, Mr. Olson, I'm sorry if I appear to be ignoring you. How are you? Oh, yes, fine, ma'am. Uh, you can call me Ollie, and uh, this here fellow usually answers to the name of Sam, especially when he's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. We don't go by formal titles. <laughs> well, the same with us. Just call us Dave and Mary. Yes. I'd like you to meet the rest of our crew. Now, perhaps we could go back to our drawing room and talk there? Well, that's an excellent idea. Uh, what we have to discuss is secret and confidential. Uh, tell me something. Yes, sir. What is a river shark? Ollie, don't mention that name in public. I'll tell you what it is when we get to the drawing room. Now, what are we waiting for? Let's go back there and start talking. I still can't get over meeting you this way. We expected to have difficulty finding you. We were even prepared to chase oh, after I'm you. I'm glad you didn't have to. But now for the point at hand. Why is it that you want to see me? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, first, let me present my credentials. Here they are. Hmm. Special agent for the United States Senate. The Committee for Historical Research of the United States. Well, these papers are certainly in order, Dave. Holy, you wish to see them? Oh, thank you, Skipper. Hmm. Here you are, Dave. Uh, what's this all about? Uh, this secret business, and uh, uh, what has that got to do with the river shark? Yeah, well, this is what is river shark. Is. Well, before I start at the beginning of my story, let me say that the river shark isn't a fish, mm -hmm. but it's a river boat. A river boat? You mean the kind with a paddle wheel on the back? Yes, a stern wheeler, buddy. Ooh, does this ever sound exciting? Mm -hmm. Say it does. What's the story about the river shark? Is it a real old timer or a modern stern wheeler? Yeah, tell us about it. No, you've even got my interest up to high pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Don't keep them in suspense any longer. Uh, there'll be some blood vessels popping if you do, including mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see your point. Well, the river shark is a small but fine stern wheeler that ran up and down the Mississippi and the Missouri back in the days when the river boats were in all their glory. The river shark was captained by Joshua Higgins, one of the finest river skippers of his day. Well, old Josh had a pilot named Abner. He could ease the stern wheeler over the highest sandbars without batting an eye. And he knew every obstacle in the two mighty rivers. Yes, sir. Old Josh was quite a boy. He sure could make the river shark go. Hey, you wine lovers in the engine room. Is this the best speed you can make? Ah, don't take on so, Josh. We're fighting upstream floodwater current. I'd say we're making tolerable good time, considering. <laughs> you do, eh? Well, we'd better be in St. Louis by morning, or I'm going to raise a tolerable lot of storm on this scow. How come you're in such an all-fired big hurry this run, Josh? How come? You know who we got on board? Nope. I don't stand gawking over the rail when the passengers come aboard. <laughs> you don't, eh? Well, you're the only person in the United States who don't. There's a couple of governors on board and some federal men. Couriers carrying dispatches to Fort Leavenworth and beyond. We also got some mail for the West Coast. So, what's so unusual about that? The River Shark's the fastest boat on the river. We always carry important people and cars. <laughs> Stay the fastest boat. Here it is. Mm -hmm. 
few boats being made in the east that can uh, outrun the river shark. <laughs> Them's ocean going and lake craft with screw propellers astern. Ah, but there ain't no boat made that can outrun this one. We'll know by morning, Admiral. We'd better see St. Louis at the crack of dawn, or there's going to be some cracked heads in the boiler room. Hey, you swabs down there! Keep those boilers hot! Don't let me catch a safety valve popping! Can't afford to waste steam! Quite a crowd in town today, Josh. Give them a greeting. See there? All them folks will tell you the river shark's right on time. As you... Fight up stream and still be on time. Yeah, you so. so. You're right, buddy. The river shark was a great boat until it suddenly vanished from the face of the earth. From you, say, yeah. you say the river shark just disappeared from sight and was never heard of again? Well, that's right, Sam. It spooked away just like the morning mist. But why? What happened? Yeah, you just can't hide a river boat like a piece of gum. Lane six, buddy. I'll say you can't. Hasn't anybody ever seen it since? Not a living soul, Hazel. <laughs> that's a peculiar one, all right. But why are you telling us all about this, Dave? Yes, I was just going to ask the same question. Well, gentlemen, I've been sent to find you and ask if you would try to find the river shark. Well, Skipper, what do you say? Do we look for the missing stern wheeler, or don't we? Oh, come on, no. Sam. I think Can't we really are. No, I don't know yet. I've got some questions. Well, fire away. Well, why is this old riverboat so important to Uncle Sam? Because we have good reason to believe that there are important historical papers locked in the safe. Okay, but what makes you think that the safe or the papers are in any kind of usable form? I think the papers would be water-soaked and destroyed by now. Well, you're going on the assumption that the boat sank in the river somewhere. Of course haven't any reason to assume otherwise. No, I guess you haven't. I've left out a chapter in my story. What do you mean? A great and extensive effort has been made down through the years to find the river shark. No one's been successful to this day to find it either in one piece or its wreckage in the river. Hmm. This gets more weird and interesting by the minute. But does Uncle Sam want us to search for this stern wheeler? We have good reason to believe that it's still in one piece and hidden somewhere. There are three parties of men searching for it now. If they find it, the contents of the safe will earn them a fortune. You mean, then, that there are teams of collectors hunting for the same thing? Yes, and you might call them history pirates, because if they find what they're looking for, the documents will become priceless. In fact, they might never be given to the public as museum pieces, and their historical content might remain secret. Also, the river shark might be destroyed by unscrupulous men to make the documents more valuable. Uncle Sam wants to save the craft. Chicago is the next station. We'll be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> well, folks, Porpoise is anchored in Belmont Harbor. In the morning, we'll go aboard and prepare to look for the river shark. Boys and girls, don't miss this adventure with Sam and the gang as they search for this important old-time riverboat. There's going to be excitement and danger as our friends search the Mississippi Valley for this boat. See you on the quarterdeck next week for more seafaring thrills with your old friend, Sailor Sam. for the listening post. Hey, what's this old post? Oh, it's 
that? Say the thing talks. Sure, I'm the listening post. The listening post? Yep. For years and years I've stood in this spot. I've seen much. I've heard much. And in my old wooden heart are stories. That's right, boys and girls. Stories are plenty crammed with fun and adventure. Crowd up close now and put your ears to the listening post. Hi, boys and girls. We're reading My Friend Flicka by Mo Mary O'Hara. It's night at the McLaughlin Ranch, the night of the day that Ken had almost accidentally stampeded the mares over the rock slide. Banner, the golden stallion, is standing at night watching over the twenty-odd mares and their foals. He twisted his massive neck and looked in another direction, down at the ranch where lived his god, Oats. The smell of the big, hard, muscular hand that held the bucket, the harsh voice that pierced his vitals. All this went with the greatest goodness that he had ever known. His world went no further. Together, he and Rob McLaughlin ran the ranch. In the fall, the two would separate the spring colts from their dams, and Banner would bite and kick and drive the mares away while McLaughlin penned the colts. In the worst of the winter blizzards, Banner would bring the mares home from five or ten miles away, knowing that McLaughlin would have been before him to open gates and doors and fill the manger of the feed shed with hay. Now and then, Banner had to do or endure something he could not understand. This, too, he accepted. When Rob McLaughlin's blazing blue eyes commanded, Banner looked no further. Now smoke was coming from the chimney of the ranch house. Banner saw it and smelled it. It was a familiar, good smell. His ears quivered, taut and listening. Often voices, shouts, barking of dogs, the piano, the radio, reached him in a medley of sounds, all good, all rob and shelter and food and companionship. But tonight, no sound but the chug of the windmill pump. Banner swung his head back again and stood straight, facing the moon. The golden fire that was in his eye when he was alert died down, and his lids half closed. Nell, too, was watching the moon rise, she was standing at the living room door, looking out across the terrace and the green. It was a Dutch door, cut horizontally in half, like a stable door, and Nell's elbows were propped on the top of the lower part. Leaning over a little, she rested her smooth, sunburned cheeks in her hands. She'd been riding that afternoon and was still in her black jodfers and white silk shirt. Dead tired, as she often was at night, she told herself that she had letters to write and she must set the sponge for tomorrow's baking, but she just stood there leaning and looking across the green. She was thinking about Ken and what he had done that day and how furious Rob had been. Nothing had been said about it to Ken. Howard always took his cue from his father, so he too ignored Ken. They talked about the mares, the colts, and how long the grass was, and which mares had not yet foaled, and the old piece of lariat that was still tied around Rocket's neck from the time, more than a year before, when Rob had tried to get Rocket in the chute, and Rocket had broken three lariats in succession. Nell had had to drive into town to buy new ropes, until, in Cheyenne, they were asking, What kind of an outlaw is the captain trying to break? The reason McLaughlin had given up trying and had let her go was because she had kicked to pieces the little wooden coop which led into the chute and so had so injured her hocks and legs that he was afraid she'd be ruined. I'm always worried about that noose around her neck. Might choke her someday, get caught in a branch or a wire. Never turn an animal out with a rope or even a halter on, not if it's to run wild for a long time. What if it did choke her? You always say she's no use to you, asked Howard. There's a responsibility we have towards animals. We use them. We shut them up, keep their natural food and water away from them. That means we have to feed and water them. Take their freedom away, rope them, harness them. That means we have to supply a different sort of safety for them. Once I've put a rope on a horse, or taken away its ability to take care of itself, then I've got to take care of it. You see that? 
That noose around her neck is a danger to her, and I put it there. So I have to get it off. Ken had not talked at all, but ate his supper in silence. At bedtime, when he came to kiss his mother goodnight, she put her hand on his head, and he pressed his forehead against her for a moment, then kissed her quickly and went to kiss his father, then up to bed. Something simply got to be done, thought Nell. I wish Rob would give him a colt. Across the green, the hill was a black silhouette against a luminous fan of moonlight that was spreading behind it. The pines were motionless. It was a calm, brooding night. The line of the hill climbed to the right and became the cliff overhanging the gorge. To the left, it ran down to nothing and joined the calf pasture. The young cottonwoods on the green, about a dozen of them that Rob had planted, were swaying. They were never quite still. The round sphere that the mass of their leaves made floated on the air with a faint whispering sound. They were a lighter green than anything else, like a girl's fairness against a black-bearded hill. What tons of water it had taken to make them grow. They had carried water in buckets, dozens, hundreds of buckets of water from the spring and poured on their roots. And even so, many of them had died and new ones had to be put in. Rob was always having to put in new little cottonwoods. They would never have been there if it hadn't been for his determination. In the fall, their leaves turned pale gold and drifted off the trees and whirled about on the green in little cyclones and curling eddies. I'm glad I've got the green, she thought. Like the village greens, home in New England. This is really like the east. No, not the east. The east is cozy. There's never the distance, the far, empty distances, the wide loneliness. Miles and miles before you come to another house. Just animals, grass and animals and sky. You can smell the loneliness. No, it's the emptiness you can smell. Of course you can smell that. It is empty. Other places, the land is full of houses and factories and towns and people and people's doings. But this is almost a desert. And it has this sweet, fresh, singing wildness. You can breathe it in the very moment you wake in the morning. And it lifts you. You could just float out the window into the blue of the sky, young and new like the country. It's just the house that's like the east. A New England country house made of pink stone, not like the western ranch houses. They're like ugly workshops, untidy, old wrecks of machines dumped anywhere, tumble-down buildings leaning together. No time, I suppose, not an ounce of energy or a minute of time left over from the awful, hopeless struggle to make a living. Sun in the wrong place where it scorches and burns and exhausts you. Black shade where you want sun and warmth. No comfort. The buildings lie in a heap as if they'd been thrown there. And there they stay. She raised her head and sniffed. The flower border below the terrace wall was crammed with iris and forget-me-nots and larkspur and lilac and petunias. It was the lilac scent that drenched the evening air. Fancy lilac, as late as this. In New England, it would have been over long ago. She felt two tiny paws against the leg of her jodfers. Polly gave a little pleading meow. When, Mel, when Nell paid no attention, she proceeded to climb up her leg, hooking her claws into the cloth. At about the belt line, Nell, in self-defense, caught hold of her and lifted her to sit on her left arm. This was the cat's favorite seat. She looped her right arm around Nell's neck holding on with a velvet paw which never permitted the tip of a claw to emerge. Nell straightened up with a sigh, leaned her cheek against Polly, and smoothed the soft fur. Then she got her sewing basket and Ken's torn saddle bank blanket and went to sit close beside Rob's desk in his study where he was working at his accounts. The big gasoline lamp on the top of Rob's desk laid a circle of brightness on the gloom of the room and enclosed them both. Nell sat with one foot under her. Her fine, narrow head was bent over her work, and her hair shone like fawn-colored satin in the lamplight. She'd been careful of her hands with her long, pointed fingers and almond-shaped nails, and they were as smooth as the brown eggs that came from the Rhode Island red hens. When she talked, she gestured with them, and they had that artless look, the lack of any clutch or grasp, the question in the bent back, reaching fingertips, which always suggests a poetic nature. Rob often watched them, thinking that they moved like something that was helpless, sea wood floating. Ken had the same hands. 
They didn't take hold. But now, weaving the blue wool in and out the torn saddle blanket, Nell's hands were quick and quick and deft. Between stitches, she glanced at her husband. His round head with the tight cap of black hair had the hardness of a profile on a coin. Presently, she said, Rob, give Kenny a colt. Rob made no answer. He might not have heard. Sitting at his desk, before him a pile of bills and a scratch pad on which he was jotting figures, he was silent and, and absorbed. Bills, thought now. I wonder which one, particularly. He's worried these days, always figuring, always accounts. He hates it, too. Hates figures as much as Ken hates them, never used to do it. This thought escaped into speech. You never used to keep so many accounts, Rob. This got an answer as his pencil jotted down the total and scored a heavy line. He leaned back with a short laugh. Ha! Huh. Huh. Never knew I'd have to. He stretched wearily. Are we broke? We're just two jumps ahead of... His voice trailed into silence, and Nell's eyes flitted wildly for a moment, as if she would find them pursuing menace, lurking in some dark corner of the house. But haven't we always been? Is it any worse? For a long time, I, I didn't know it. Know what? That each year I was worth less money instead of more. Is it really like that, Rob? It is. A rancher or a farmer can't know whether he's operating at a profit or a loss unless he makes a very careful yearly inventory. I read that in a government bulletin once. That's what jacked me up. You can see why it's true. Equipment deteriorates. Buildings run down. There are stock losses. Indebtedness increases. But it's also gradual, almost imperceptible. A man doesn't notice it. He drifts along, thinking that things are about as they always were. You see it all around here. Some poor devil trying to renew a loan or get a new one he badly needs. Finding out he hasn't got anything left that the banks will lend on. He's been on the downgrade for a long time and never knew it. Hits him all of a sudden. He's bankrupt. And the day before, he thought he was a capitalist. Well, I take the trouble now to know where I stand. And is it? Are we on the downgrade? We are. But we're more and more careful all the time. We spend less, don't have as much help. Why, we're actually stingy. In the beginning, I still had some capital, what was left over when I bought the ranch. I was going to save that. Should have. Would have sent the boys to college. But now that's gone. Of course, I thought that when I got the horses well started, when they were of an age to sell, I'd make it all back and more. But expenses always keep ahead of me. With so many purebred horses, for instance, and more coming all the time, there are such walloping taxes. This always made Rob angry. It's a cockeyed law to put high taxes on registered stock. It ought to be the other way around. They ought to tax out of existence this run-down mongrel stuff that Wyoming's full of. It would be better for the state if they did. I wish I had nothing but registered horses. These colts of Gypsy and the albino have put a bad strain into my stock. He sat scowling for a moment. The worst thing of all is, I can't sell my horses at a profit. Not even at cost, most of the time. This struck a chill through Nell. Everything depended on the horses. Perhaps the markets will get better. Her voice reflected the fear in her heart. That's all. Bye. There you are, boys and girls. Listen next time when Flo Schmid comes your way with a story from the Listening Post. Now it's time for Captain Skids. Welcome aboard the Good Ship Salvation, boys and girls. We allow older folks on board, too, because we know everyone enjoys a voyage with Captain Jesus and the Captain's kids. 
And we have our special storyteller on board with us today. Do you know who that is? Oh, chillin'. It's Uncle Remus time. And Mr. Jimmy Scribner told me to come over here and sit down on this porch, and I'd have plenty chillin' to tell this story to you. And look at the chillin' there is. Oh, and what a story. And after working behind that old hard-working mule all day of plowing in the cotton field, I sure do love to sit down and tell stories to the chillin'. If y'all recommend us, and I show that you do, because I wouldn't want y'all forgetting nothing about the, the telling that I've been doing. If y'all recommend us, there was a circus line that got away, and that circus line got away the day that the big old circus train left town, and the lion's cage was the last wagon on the flat car. And there's such a big jerk that the flat car jerked, and, and, the, and the lion cage fell over and bust loose, and the lion jumped out and headed for the forest where old Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear and little Br'er Rabbit and Sis Crow and Sis Jay Bird and Br'er Squirrel and Br'er Snake and all the rest of them live. <laughs> and what a time it is. Cause it's fortunate for everybody that old lion and ain't got no teeth or nothing and mighty friendly and all that cause being in the circus like it is, you know, Lions that in the circus that way, they gotta be kind of friendly, cause just it wouldn't do for them lions to bust a loose or nothing like that. Cause if they do bust a loose and they won't friendly, they could cause a lot of trouble. And this was the best old lion that you ever saw. <laughs> and I gonna tell, oh, look who done come in to sit down alongside of me. It's Miss Missy. And just as soon as I talk to her a little bit, I gonna tell you all about how old Br'er Fox heading down the hill to see could he be as brave as little Br'er Rabbit and talk to the lion. <laughs> sit down here, Miss Missy. Yeah, sit right there. He got ticks on him. Oh, he is? Well, that's all right. You sit right there and old Uncle Remus will tell you about this story. What you been doing today, Miss Missy? Oh, I've been playing. Been playing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you hear the first part of the story? Well, old Br'er Fox was heading down the hill to see could he talk with the lion like little Br'er Rabbit was doing. And that's what little Br'er Rabbit was doing. He was talking to that lion just like that he knowed that lion all his life. And old Br'er Fox, he think that lion is ferocious and he think the lion got teeth. But that lion ain't got that first tooth in his head. He ain't got no teeth. Almost like old Uncle Remus, we ain't got no teeth hardly. And that old lion didn't do a thing in the world but sit right down by little Br'er Rabbit. And little Br'er Rabbit sit down by the lion. And Br'er Rabbit say, Who there? What is you? And the lion say, Well, I'm uh, back out. Uh, boy, I'm a lion. <laughs> I'm with that, uh, the suckers. <laughs> and the thing... The thing that I lived in the cage, it, it fell off the railroad car, and when it fell off, it hit the ground and busted all the pieces, and I jumped out, and then the thing, the railroad car went on, and I didn't have anywhere to go, so I came over to the forest. I hope you'll excuse me, and I hope you won't mind. No, I don't mind. <laughs> I'm glad that you did it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Here come old Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear. They don't know that you're friendly. And they're the kind that if they find out that you're friendly, that they'll take the most advantage of you. So you go out and play like you're mighty powerful tough. Well, uh, I don't know much about playing that, bro. Oh, try. <laughs> if you think that I can, of course, not having any teeth, it's awfully hard to try to pretend that you're tough. <laughs> I couldn't even eat a tough piece of beefsteak, much less be tough myself. I know, but they done not they don't, they don't stop. Hi, Br'er Fox. Oh, hello, Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> uh, uh, I see that you're talking to that lion there. Uh, uh, I ain't never seen no rabbit talking to no lion before. <laughs> Nobody's scared of nothing. You're scared of that lion. You're scared of that lion. You're laughing like you ain't afraid of him, but I know you're afraid of him. You're scared to death of that lion. Is you scared of the lion? Sure enough, Br'er Fox. 
If you is, why don't you admit it? Well, now, wait a minute, Br'er Rabbit. I don't ever want you to get the idea in your head that anything that, that I'm scared of, that you ain't scared of. Oh, <laughs> then if you ain't scared of the lion, why don't you walk up to him? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> well, why don't you do it? Well, well uh, <laughs> I, uh, 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 is he really mean and ferocious? Sure, he mean and ferocious. <laughs> Go on, get close to him. He got teeth that big as telephone poles. <laughs> Go on, Br'er Fox, get a little closer. Uh, Br'er Bear, you in the lead there. Go ahead down there and get close to him. Let's see what you're going to do. Now, what do you mean? I ain't going to do nothing. I as close as I'm going to get right now, boy. I don't know what you mean by being in the lead and close to him. Uh, the damnest words that I don't even uh, understand are presonate. And I presonate it much more if you just, uh, I don't say no more about the thing yourself, and uh, let's get on about our business. The lion ain't bobbing us. Uh, what is the use of us bobbing the lion? Uh, what I'm getting at is, I mean, uh, by that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you right. Uh, <laughs> well, well, we just want to say hello anyway, little bit of rabbit. We won't go bobbing the lion or nothing. <laughs> He is a tough-looking, mean-looking thing there. Goodness gracious. Uh, come on, Br'er Bear, let's go. Uh, so long, Br'er Rabbit. Ho, oh, oh, ho, you cowards. Is that what you is, cowards? Oh, be quiet, Sis Crow. Ain't nobody said nothing to you, you old busybody. Cowards, cowards, cowards. Ho, oh, ho, oh, ho. Oh. Well, that's the way the meeting happened, too. That's for sure, children, and <laughs> Miss Missy. And you know, old Br'er Fox didn't do a thing in the world but tuck his tail twixt and tween his legs and went home to his den. And so did old Br'er Bear. And that night, Br'er Squirrel and old Br'er Snake called on old Br'er Fox. Mm -hmm. Br'er Squirrel knock on the door, and Abby knock on the door, Br'er Fox come over and open the door, and Br'er Fox say, Who is it? Don't go. D -d 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 don't you recognize me? D -d 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 I'm Br'er Squirrel. I don't allow no squirrels around my... Squirrels. <laughs> That's right. They're good to eat. <laughs> come on in, Br'er Squirrel. Don't go. D -d 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 not on your tin tight. So long. And with that, Br'er Squirrel licking and split and hit and landed in a tree, and Br'er Fox couldn't even get close to him. Then Br'er Snake, he speak up, and Br'er Snake say, My, my, my. Oh, so you with him, huh? There's two of you. Yes. I'm not good to eat, though, because I'm a snake. You can ask me to come in, and I shall come if you ask me. In fact, being a snake, I'll go in anyway, whether you ask me or not. <laughs> but chillin', old Br'er Snake was a laughing and wiggled in through the door and went over to where old Br'er Fox was got a fire in the fireplace. And when Br'er Fox come back in and sit down after the door done closed, Br'er Snake say, Everybody in the entire city is talking about you. In the city? Yes, even the folkses that lives down in the city in the village. And, of course, all of the animals in the great outdoors and the forest. You is the topic of conversation everywhere. And they all has one word for you. What is that one word? Coward. <laughs> Stop that laughing. I don't allow us no laughing in here. Especially when somebody call me something like that. You know as I ain't no coward. I never will have been no coward, and I don't intend to start being no coward now. Everyone says that that little rabbit is braver than you. He walks all over the forest with the lion. But you, you scampered away as though something had you. Uh, there's one way to prove that I'm braver than that, that sneaky rabbit. And that's to catch him and eat him. They think he's brave enough to walk with a lion, and then I turn around and eat something that is brave enough to walk with a the lion, then can't nobody say that I is a coward. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going out and catch him right now. 
goodness gracious alive and what happened after that go make up the bestest goodest telling story that you done heard in a long time and old uncle remus telling you right now children don't you miss it <clears throat> Thank you so much. This old Uncle Remus promising you that they're going to be more fun in telling on the story at the same time tomorrow when old Br'er Fox try to catch little Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> and what happened after that, especially when that lion get after him, is sure going to make some telling. Until then, thank you for the day. Bless your heart and goodbye, everybody. Little Br'er Rabbit is enjoying pretending he is brave and not afraid of a big bad lion. He even told a lie and said the lion had big teeth. He better watch out or his lies will get him in trouble. Sunbeams for Jesus. Leviticus 19, 15-18 He shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among the people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not eat thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and not suffer sin unto him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. The missing sweater. Mother. I can't find my lavender sweater, wailed Phyllis. When was the last time you wore it? Mother asked. Phyllis wrinkled her bars. Last Sunday, I think. Maybe you left it at church, Mother suggested. Called the office and asked if anyone turned it in. But the sweater wasn't there. That was my favorite sweater, moaned Phyllis. It's the most expensive one I have ever had. We'll keep looking for it, Mother said. It will probably show up, but you need to go now. There's the school bus. Several times that week, Phyllis searched in vain for her sweater. She wanted to wear it to a Sunday school party at Melissa's house on Friday evening. But with a sigh, she chose something else. Arriving at the party, Phyllis stared in amazement at Marcy, one of the girls in her class. Drawing Melissa closer, she whispered, Marcy's wearing my sweater. She must have picked it up at Sunday school. Are you sure? Melissa whispered back. Of course, Phyllis hissed. She can't afford a sweater like that. As the girls were talking with Marcy later, Melissa said, That's a pretty sweater, Marcy. Where did you get it? Massey blushed and lowered her head. My mother bought it at a garbage sale, she told them. I'll bet, muttered Phyllis. She was angry and told several girls that Massey had stolen her sweater. Somehow, the party wasn't much fun for her after that. When Phyllis reached home, her grandmother met her at the door. Phyllis gave her a big hug, as mother said. You will be glad to see what grandma bought you, mother added. Phyllis, mother handed Phyllis her lavender sweater. But, 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 where did you find this? Phyllis stammered. You left it at my house last Sunday, Grandma told her. Tears welled up in Phyllis' eyes. I've made a terrible mistake, she 
side have told you about it after I make some phone calls. How about you? Have you ever falsely accused someone? Did you apologize? Next time you are tempted to accuse someone, wait. God says, Christians should be slow to speak. You know that hasty conclusions are often wrong. Hurting others with false accusation is a poor testimony. If you have done that, be sure to apologize. James 1.19 Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. <laughs> can't do wrong and get by. The Bible tells us that. It says, be sure your sin will find you out. We cannot hide from God. He sees everything we do. Our next story tells us more about that. Baseballs and rose bushes. Bobby never thought of himself as a thief or a liar either for that matter. He just thought it stupid not to help himself to what he wanted even though he might have to lie about it. Uh, one day, Bobby and his sister Sally went with their mom to the neighborhood supermarket. Now remember, kids, I don't want you wandering around the store. Stay with me so that when I check out, you'll be right there to help carry the groceries home. Okay, but let's hurry. These places are dull. I'll get the cart. Oh, Mother, look! They have baseballs. Can I get one? You don't need another one. I have only one baseball, and I left it at Aunt Mildred's. It's not doing me any good there. You'll just have to wait until you get it back. But, Mother, she lives so far away. The summer will be half over before we go there or she comes here. Well, I had to wait when I left my doll there. I didn't get it back until Aunt Mildred brought it. Oh, dolls, you can get along without them. Quiet down, Bobby. Reach a box of soap for me. There, that's it. Now, let's see now. We need uh, coffee and cereal. I'll go get the cereal, Mom. All right, but get something everybody likes. Okay, I will. Oh, Mother, you know he'll only get what he likes. I'm so tired of eating the same old thing. We'll see what he brings. If it isn't something we all like, we'll put it back and find something else. Right now, let's take a look at the meat. Here's your change, ma'am. Thank you. Now, do you need help carrying these? No, thanks. I brought my help. Here you are, son. Can you carry this one? And, Sally, I think you can manage this, can't you? I guess so. You kids run along home. I have to stop at the dry cleaners to pick up your dad's suit. Okay, Mom. Bye. Here comes Mrs. Blake. She's such an old grouch. Bobby, if you don't stop saying things like that about people, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Besides, half of the time, you're the one who makes them grouchy. No wonder they get mad when you act the way you do. I suppose Mrs. Blake is always nice to you. Well, I get along with her okay. I try to treat people the way I want to be treated. That's the difference between you and me. Shh, be quiet. Good morning, Mrs. Blake. Good morning, Sally and Bobby. Oh, say, Bobby, I found a baseball in my yard last evening. Did you happen to lose it? 
Oh, uh, yes, I did. But, Bobby, I'll just bring it over this evening. I'm glad I found the owner. Goodbye. Bobby, how could you lie like that? You know that isn't your ball. So what? She doesn't know whose it is. It's a sure thing she can't use it, so I might as well have it. You're going to get caught for telling lies. Just wait and see. Tell me how. Whoever threw that ball into Mrs. Blake's yard isn't going to go and ask her for it. If they were, they'd have done it by now. So who's going to know or care? But you're always lying. I'm not either. Anyhow, if I do decide to tell a little white lie now and then, what does it matter as long as it doesn't hurt anybody? You worry too much. <laughs> Thanks for putting the groceries away, kids. That's okay. By the way, Bobby, what kind of cereal did you get? I don't even remember seeing any when we checked out. I didn't see any either. What kind did you get, Bobby? I... I didn't get any. I was still looking them over when Sally came after me. Then I guess you'll have to run back to the store and get some. I'll go, Mom. That's fine. Here, Bobby, you take your father's suit and hang it in his closet. Okay. Mother, I hate to tell you this, but Bobby's been lying again. When we were coming home, Mrs. Blake met us. She asked Bobby if he lost a baseball, and he said he did. She found one in her yard, and she's bringing it over tonight. Well, he certainly can't keep it. I'll have to talk to him about lying again. You run along, Sally. All right, Mother. I'll be back soon. Mother, is it all right if I go to the park now? In a little while, Bobby, but first sit down for a minute. I want to talk to you. I understand that you've been lying again. Sally's a tattletale. She's worried about you, son, and I am too. Lying is a very serious thing. The ball Mrs. Blake found in her yard is not yours. You know that because you left yours at Aunt Mildred's. I don't know what you're so upset about. Mrs. Blake found a ball, and she doesn't know whose it is. What's wrong with me having it? But you said it was yours, and it isn't. Taking what isn't yours is stealing. Bobby, you've asked Jesus to come into your life, haven't you? Sure. Well, you know what God says. Thou shalt not lie. As a Christian, aren't you ashamed to lie the way you do? Well, I just don't see where I'm hurting anybody. I figure I might as well have the balls to let Mrs. Blake keep it. Bobby, one thing's for sure. You can't go on this way. Either you change your ways, or something will have to be done to change them for you. And you will not be keeping that ball. Hi, Daddy. Did you have a good day? Did you work hard? Well, hi, Sally. Yep, I worked hard and I had a good day besides. How about you? Not bad. I worked hard, too. Mm. I went to the grocery store twice and I helped Mom make supper. Well, good for you. Is Bobby home? Yeah, he's washing up for supper. Uh, see who's at the door, Sal, okay? Oh, hi, Mrs. Blake. Mother, Mrs. Blake is here. Coming. Hi, Nora. Come in and sit down. Good evening. I've come to see Bobby. How are you, Nora? Quite well. Ah, uh, here's the boy I want to see. Hi, did you bring my ball? Yes, I did. But why didn't you come and get your ball after it came into the yard? Well, you see, I, uh, I didn't know it went into your yard. I just threw it, and I wasn't sure where it went. I'm afraid that I can't believe that. Bobby, when your ball landed in my yard, it broke one of my best rose bushes. When you saw your ball come into my yard, it was your duty to come and see if any damage had been done. You may have your ball back Bobby, when... Bobby, you must explain to Mrs. Blake. You know that's not your I ball. I beg your pardon? Why, I asked him just this morning if it were his, and he admitted it. But I know that it isn't his, Nora. He left his ball at his aunt's house last week. Say, that's right. Uh, what made you think this could be your ball, Bobby? Uh, did you forget about leaving it at Aunt Mildred's? I, uh, well, I see how things are here. The ball belongs to the boy until you find out it has damaged something. 
Then it isn't uh, uh, his. Wait a minute. That isn't so, Nora. I I'm sorry Bobby said the ball was his, but it, it just isn't true. Well, I am simply amazed. You claim to be Christians. You even teach Sunday school. I suppose you teach other people's children not to lie. Why, you're just hypocrite. I I'm sorry you feel that way, Nora. Let me I'll try to... i the ball. It might be cheaper for you to buy your boy another ball than to replace my rosebush. But believe me, I'll let people know just how deceitful and dishonest you are. Nora, if you'll just... Well, Bobby? I... I don't know what to say. Son... This lying must stop, and it must stop right now. Can you still say it doesn't hurt anybody? No, I, I feel so bad about it all. I never thought it would hurt you, but, but she accused you of lying. I feel awful. I think we all do, because yes, you did hurt us. We're being blamed for your sin. But even worse, son, you hurt the name of the Lord. How sad he must feel. I'm so sorry about it all. How can I ever make it right again? What can I do? Well, son, if, if you'll confess your sin to God, he will forgive you. Then with his help, you can overcome this bad habit of lying. I think you need to see what you can do to settle things with Mrs. Blake, too. Don't you? You mean like, like go tell Mrs. Blake the truth? That's what I mean. She may not believe you, but perhaps if you pay for her rosebush and let her keep the ball, it would help. What do you think? Oh, okay. Uh, that'll be hard, though. Yes, it will. But you can do some extra chores to earn money for the rosebush. All right. I just hate to even face her, but I'll do it. Oh, I hope I never tell a lie ever again, and I'm going to ask God to help me. slip up and say something we shouldn't. We need Jesus to help us to always tell the truth. Do you have a problem with lying? Do lies slip out of your mouth before you know it? Ask Jesus to help you stop and remember to tell the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He can help us to tell the truth. Well, boys and girls, our voyage has come to an end for today, and we must sail home. This is your cousin Christina saying goodbye and see you again next time with all the captain's kids. Captain's kids, captain's kids, the Lord is a captain of our salvation. Tomorrow bright light shining in the night, guides us through the heavenly shore. Captain's kids. If the text is biblical in concept and the music appropriate in style, the right kind of Christian music can break the stony heart as a hammer, soothe the broken spirit as a balm, call men to battle as a trumpet, communicate the gospel as a messenger, 
instruct the student as a teacher, and nourish the soul as food. To enjoy all the best in Christ-honoring Christian music, keep your dial set to AM 1400 and FM 94.5, The Harbor Light. The time is 6.30. Stay tuned now for Stories of Great Christians. We greet our friends everywhere with Chapter 2 of New England Firebrand, the story of Roger Williams. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians. As a boy in London during the high-handed reign of James I, Roger Williams fell under the Puritan influence and made a personal surrender to Christ at the age of 11. During the years that followed, in spite of determined opposition from his parents and punishment and rebukes from the pastor of the local parish of the established church, young Roger Williams remained faithful to his new convictions. The early years of the 17th century were times of tremendous challenge to a young man the struggle between the forces of freedom and those of authoritarianism was steadily mounting. The king and the established church stood for the doctrine of the divine right of kings and the spiritual authority of the bishops. Against them stood the Puritans, intellectuals, and the rising merchant class. There were brilliant and influential men on both sides of the struggle, and among the Puritan leaders, few if any were more respected than England's foremost legal mind Sir Edward Coke. It was inevitable that an alert Puritan lad like Roger Williams living in London would be one of Coke's admirers. While still in his teens, he began laying plans to see and hear the distinguished lawyer in action, and of all places, in the powerful court of the Star Chamber. It was to his friend Thomas that Roger first confided his ambitious intentions. Oh, it's a fine enough idea, Roger, but I think you must be a little mad. And why do you say that, Thomas? Because I think you're mad not on one, but on two counts. <laughs> now, there's a fine friend accusing me of being twice mad. Why so? First, for thinking you can obtain entrance to the Star Chamber at all. Well, they say it almost takes a title to get past the door. <laughs> I'll grant you I've no title, but being related to those who have just might make it possible. Oh, you'll be thinking of the Lydes and the Pembertons, then. I am. And what a titled kinfolk good for, if not to help out in matters of this kind? Mm, that's true. And perhaps you're only half as mad as I thought. But the other half still stands. <laughs> Don't be too sure. But if I heard you right, I'm sure. Didn't you say that you'd come from the chamber with a written record of every word spoken in argument by Sir Edward Coke? <laughs> I did. Well, then I know you're mad. Why, Sir Edward is famous as a fiery speaker, as well as a defender of freedom against the king in matters of law. Fiery for sure. They say he's downright brutal when carried away by the force of his own argument. Well, some call him the tyrant of Westminster Hall. Yes, yeah, a strange tyrant that defends the common law against the king. Oh, I don't call him a tyrant myself, but, well, to catch the words of such a man in the full heat of a courtroom battle, why, that's impossible. No human hand could write the words as fast as they flow. <laughs> I still say I'll set down every word. And I still say you're mad. <laughs> Thomas, if I weren't a Christian, I'd tempt you to a wager. And if I weren't a Christian, I'd accept. <laughs> well, then, for the sake of your purse and both of our testimonies, I'd best let you in on my secret. More madness? No, but, but an idea I've been working on for some time now. I'll show you. Here, uh, first, I take writing materials. So... So, and then I'll ask you to speak a bit on whatever enters your mind while I take it down. Word for word? Word for word. Then I'd best speak slowly. Oh, not at all. Speak as fast as you like. No, I see. It's madness. Very well, then. We'll begin. <clears throat> Let me see. <clears throat> all right. I have a young friend, Roger Williams by name, whose desire to see the great lawyer, Sir Edward Coke, defending freedom in the Star Chamber, has addled his tender wits. Though he were as rich as Sir Edward himself, and as powerful, and as brilliant, he cannot so much as set down these few words as they fall from my lips. There. What did I say, Boaster? <clears throat> I have a young friend, Roger Williams by name, whose desire to see the great lawyer, Sir Edward Coke, defending freedom in the Star Chamber, 
has addled his tender wits, though he was as rich as Sir Edward himself, and as powerful, <laughs> and as Roger, brilliant. enough. Those are my very words. Isn't that what I promised? Well, it is, and I was wrong. But, Roger, is this a good thing? I think it's so. Why not? Well, it smacks of witchcraft, to my thinking. Let me see that paper. <laughs> no witchcraft, Thomas. J just this. With these strange marks and scratches and curlicues, they tell you what I said? They do. Yeah, they still have the look of witchcraft. <laughs> well, put your mind at ease, Thomas. This is no witchcraft, but a sort of cipher I've devised for saving time and setting things down. And it really works. Didn't I prove that a moment ago? No, I can't deny that. Well, then, you're planning to take down all the words of Sir Edward Coke in, in the Star Chamber? I am. That is, if you gain admittance to the Star Chamber at all. I think I can do it, Thomas. You, uh, you might as well know, I've asked for admittance not only for myself, but for you as well. For me, Roger? Oh, I don't believe it. <laughs> Soon I'll begin to call you Doubting Thomas. <laughs> I've proved the one point, my boy. Can't you trust me for the other? Well, I hope you're right, Roger. There's nothing I'd like more than to hear Sir Edward plead for Parliament in the State Chamber. You and I. We'll see, Thomas. We'll see. <laughs> I couldn't really believe it was true, Roger, until the guard at the door took our papers and waved us inside. <laughs> I'll confess I had my doubts, too. Why, I've never seen so many title folks in one place before. Why, we must be the only commoners in the chamber. Do you see Sir Edward Coke? No. Which is he? Yonder at the table, sitting next to the bald-looking fellow in the blue cloak. You mean? Oh, I see him now, Roger. Why, I've never seen a more distinguished-looking man in my life. Distinguished, indeed. He even entertained the Queen herself some 20 years ago at Castle Acres. Yes, I've heard the tale. He gave her jewels and gifts to the value of more than 1,200 pounds sterling. And now the man stands openly for the Puritan cause. Yes, he risks all to do that. It takes courage. Yes, it does. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This honorable court is now in session. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The court will now hear an argument that's honourable and worthy gentlemen, Sir Edward Kirk. This is it, Roger. This is what we came to hear. Oh, it looks like a lion, doesn't it, Thomas? Are, are you going to take it all down in that scratching cipher of yours? Yeah, I am. And may God guide my hand. Shh, he's beginning to speak. The cause under consideration may be established on principles of law, long recognised by the classic authorities. I have lately prepared an exhaustive comment on the first institute of Littleton, which clearly supports the contention we consider here in this present cause. <coughs> now, in matters within this area, I am known to be a strong supporter and defender of the rights of Parliament. I do not propose to alter my position now. until tomorrow at the same hour. I don't know what you think, Thomas, but I think the man's superb. Superb isn't a strong enough word, Roger. Tell me, did you manage to take down every word? I saw your hand flying all the time he was speaking. I think I did, Thomas. Though my fingers are so numb, I can scarcely move them. The man's a regular fountain of words. Roger. Huh? Sir Edward. What about him? I, I think he's coming this way. We'll get a closer look at him. Oh, wouldn't I love to speak to him, though? Yeah, a cat may look at the king, but I think a young man had better not speak to Sir Edward. Yes, it would be sheer impertinence, I confess. He's coming straight toward us. You, you don't suppose he'd speak to us? Hardly. Young man. Aye, sir, young man. He, he's speaking to you, Roger. <gasps> That's impossible. You, sir, with the great pile of papers on your knee. You mean me, sir? I do, young man. What was it you were up to all the while I was speaking? Uh, writing, sir. That I know. But writing what? Why, sir, sir, setting down your speech as you gave it. I thought as much. But I speak a great deal too rapidly for any clerk to follow. 
You must have taken down only the key points. No, no sir. What do you mean, no, sir? I, I, I mean, Sir Edward, that I've taken it down word for word from beginning to end. That's impossible. Let me see it. Yes, sir. Here. Are you having sport with me, boy? These are not but the scratchings of some barnyard fowl. Well, sir, it's a, it's a sort of cipher I've devised. A fast hand for work of this sort. Indeed. And can you read it now? I... I can, sir. Prove it. <coughs> the cause under consideration may be established on principles of law long recognized by the classic authorities. I have lately prepared an exhaustive comment on the first institutes of Littleton, which clearly supports the contention we consider here in this present cause. Now, in That's that enough, is lad. If you've done as well throughout, it's flawless. You say you've devised this thing yourself. Does anyone else know of it? Only my friend Thomas here, sir. And he hasn't learned the trick of it as yet. And what's your name? Roger Williams, sir. My father's James Williams, a merchant tailor. Oh, yes, I've heard of him. And you and I are on opposite sides in matters of religion. Oh, no, sir. I'm a Puritan, sir, as you are. I understood your father was staunch Church of England. That he is. But I've been a Puritan since I was 11 years old. In defiance of your father? Yes, sir. Hasn't that caused you trouble? It has that, Sir Edward. But the Bible says that a man's enemies are the men of his own house. And, and St. Paul wrote, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. I say, you're a serious Bible scholar at that. Though I notice you quote from this new translation authorized by King James. Well, is that wrong, sir? I think not. In time, it may well be accepted by English-speaking people everywhere. Though I grant it sounds strange to my ears, those who did the work are known to be as men of much prayer, and I believe they were guided by God's Holy Spirit. Oh, yes, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say it, sir. Now then, I find you a likable lad, Roger Williams. And a talent like yours for taking down the words spoken could be of great use to a man of the law like myself. Do you suppose now you could learn to get along with a crusty old man like me? Oh, I don't understand. How, how do you mean, sir? No, I don't find you crusty at all. You will, Roger, if you enter my employ. If, if what? The thing I'm suggesting is that you enter my house and service as a sort of a confidential clerk. I believe you could go far with the proper training and friends. And I propose to provide them. How would you feel about me as your patron? Oh, I'd be honoured, Sir Edward. Well, then, is it yes or no? I'm a busy man, you know. Oh, it, it, it's yes, Sir Edward. But, but, but what else? Yes, of course. And so we conclude Chapter 2 of New England Firebrand, the story of Roger Williams. This has been another in the series, Stories of Great Christians. <laughs>